right, John Reed, where are you? You close? Right here? Give him a hand, everybody. John Reed. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, for some reason, I, before I start, I want to, every time I come here, there's a moment where I notice the person doing the tooting, and I put myself in that position, and I just think it would be so difficult to do. So, I mean, you're going to have to toot to me, and it's, you know, completely okay. Um, um, I, uh, I moved to New York in 1986 at the age of 21, in part because in California I was a drug addict alcoholic, and I thought that in New York maybe I wouldn't be. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, no, really, really. <laughs> and um, and um, the day after I got here, I got a job as a waiter, and the, and the chef in that restaurant was Ed. He looked uh, like I imagined Tadzio from Death in Venice. He had uh, fair skin, curly blonde hair, and I moved in with him as soon as I could. And uh, we, were, we moved to another restaurant about two years later where we met Michael. He was also a chef. And he looked kind of like a um, Giacometti sculpture. You know, he was too tall, too thin, uh, pockmarked skin, and, but funny as hell. And the three of us became extremely tight. And after a couple of years, of our friendship, Michael asked us to his apartment in Gramercy Park, and he sat Ed and me down and told us that he had, he had AIDS. And he could not hide it anymore because he knew his situation was deteriorating too rapidly. Within a year of that, he had gone completely blind with CMV retinitis, and he was spending a night or two uh, sleeping in the bathtub. The diarrhea was so bad. And um, during these years, maybe 50% of our friends were in the exact same position. And surprisingly enough, my alcoholism did not abate but it just kind of blew up, you know, during, during this point. And one day, Michael and I were in his apartment um, watching movies, which, you know, he still liked to do, even though he was blind, because he could, he could play them in his head, you know. So he was just kind of staring at the ceiling as we listened. And apropos of nothing, he said, John, I'm going to die soon, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And I was just so, you know, taken back. And I, I, uh, I said, yeah, Michael, I, I know that. And he sat up and looked at me, you know, locating me by my voice, and said, but John, you're killing yourself. And it's breaking my heart. And I was, and I quit shortly after that. Um, some people who quit drinking, they count days. And I had roughly 90 days when my partner, Ed, was walking ahead of me down the staircase from our apartment complex. And I noticed that. Um, the sinews from the bottom of his neck were kind of roping to the base of his skull. And I thought, when did that happen? <laughs> and he went, he went into Cabrini the next day, and he spent five, uh, three weeks in there. Michael's apartment was directly ac across Third Avenue from Cabrini. And after Ed had been in the hospital about a week, Michael took the pills he had stockpiled. And I could not. I would. I chose not to tell Ed that Michael was dead. Um, but a week later was Michael's memorial in the apartment on Gramercy Park, and I was like, I've got to tell him. You know, his his best friend has just left the planet, and we can't have the whole thing pass by, the memorial and everything. So two men volunteered to walk me across Third Avenue, and I fainted along the way. And we got to the hospital, and I told Ed that Michael had died, and um, I did not tell him that uh, I had just been diagnosed because it all just felt like too much. You know, the whole fucking world was falling apart, you know, and he just needed a second, just a second to heal from the PCP and the thrush and the KS. You know, the next three years were Ed going in and out, in and out, in and out of hospitals until he was finally at Roosevelt Hospital. And this one day I was standing looking out the window and I he called to me from the bathroom in this voice that was just... You know, uh, childlike and just so sad. Um, John, I need you. Uh, so I went to the bathroom, and for the first time he couldn't stand up. But he made eye contact with me, and with tears just streaming down his face, he said, look at me. I'm not even human anymore. And I followed his gaze, and we were looking his penis, you know, which like his, the most of his lower body and his face had just turned black purple with cancer. You know, but his, um, his penis had ruptured. 
who knew who knew that that was something that could happen, you know? So I got him up and got him to bed, and we sat on the bed, you know, side by side with our legs kind of hanging out at the edge. And um, he put his um, head on my shoulder and kind of dropped his weight into me, and I put my hand on his heart and, and just, and he, you know, he cried and cried softly, and then he fell asleep. And I was there looking at this hospital wall, and I was so torn because part of, I just, part of me wanted to run. I mean, I wanted to run back to California and leave all of this suffering and all this sh shit and just misery behind me, you know, just like I thought I could leave the alcohol in California. And part of me wanted to pick up the fucking building and just smash it. You know, I just wanted everything to stop, you know, but the biggest part of me, um, the biggest part of me wanted to be there when he woke up. And I wanted him to know that whenever he woke up from that point on, I would be there. And that was 1994, and he died during that hospitalization. And in, that, in 1994, I quit the restaurant business, and I started working at a place called Friends Indeed. And just totally, totally by coincidence, it's in this building. And even greater coincidence, my desk is literally right, right above my head. This window you know, on the seventh floor has been my window for 19 years. And friends in, at Friends Indeed, we provide, provide free emotional support to anyone diagnosed with a life-threatening illness. So for 19 years, it's been my objective uh, along, that, that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel bad. Uh, it's been my, my objective, you know, with my pool of volunteers to make sure that whoever walks through our front door, you know, with, whether they have breast cancer, uh, liver failure, heart failure, uh, HIV AIDS, from that moment, they walk through that door all the way through their process, doctor's visits, oncology treatments, hospital stays, all the way until they left the, leave the planet. They don't have to do one step of it, not one bit of it alone. Thank you.